Okay, we're going to get started. Oh, that always comes on so loud. I can hear myself. I listen to me all week. And so, <laughs> yeah, you too. We're going to uh, look at the book of Philemon this morning. And it's just a one-chapter book, so we'll be out of here in about 10 minutes. Uh, or maybe not. So let me pray, and then we'll get at it. Father, this morning we're grateful again that uh, you wrote some things down. You wrote important things down. As you said and told Moses in Deuteronomy 34, These are not just words. This is your life. And so, Father, we're grateful that we can actually look at things that are our life. So I pray that that would be the case today. Uh, Bless this time and make it count for more than this Sunday morning. Pray this in your name. Amen. Since Philemon is uh, short, I am going to read the whole book, and I'm going to do it a little different. I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible. I don't generally read it out of there, and that's not where I study, but we're going to read it out of this morning. From Paul, in jail for preaching the good news about Jesus Christ, and from Brother Timothy. To Philemon, our much-loved fellow worker, and to the church that meets in your home. And to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, who, like myself, is a soldier of the cross. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you his blessings and his peace. I always thank God when I'm praying for you, dear Philemon, because I keep hearing of your love and trust in the Lord Jesus and in his people. And I pray that as you share your faith with others, it will grip their lives, too as they see the wealth of good things in you that come from Christ Jesus. I myself have gained much and com- joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because your kindness has so often refreshed the hearts of God's people. Now, I want to ask a favor of you. I could demand it of you in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. But I love you and prefer just to ask you, I, Paul, an old man now here in jail for the sake of Jesus Christ. My plea is that you should show kindness to my child, Onesimus, whom I won to the Lord while here in my chains. Onesimus, whose name means youthful, useful, hasn't been of much use to you in the past. But now he is going to be of real use to both of us. I'm sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I really wanted to keep him here with me while I was in these chains for preaching the good news, and you would have been helping me through him, but I didn't want to do it without your consent. I didn't want you to be kind because you had to, but because you wanted to. Perhaps you could think of it this way, that he ran away from you for a little while, well, so that he now can be yours forever. No longer only a slave, but something much better a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you too because he is not only a servant but also your brother in Christ. If I'm really your friend, give him the same welcome you'd give me if I were the one who was coming. If he has harmed you in any way or stolen anything from you, charge me for it. I'll pay it back. I, Paul, personally guarantee this by writing it here with my own hand but I won't mention how much you owe me. The fact is, you even owe me your very soul. Yes, dear brother, give me joy with this loving act, and my weary heart will praise the Lord. I've written you this letter because I am positive that you will do what I ask, and even more. Please keep a guest room ready for me. For I'm hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me come to you soon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, who is also here for preaching Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The blessings of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
be upon your spirit. Paul. Uh, let me <clears throat> tell you a story. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a man, and you know how the stories start and how they go, and we just don't always know how they end. But they all happen somewhere, and they all have characters who play certain roles. Sometimes we know the details of those places and players right up front. Some are introduced partway through the story, and some don't show up till the very end. And as you well know, many stories are make-believe. Not this one. This is straight from Scripture. Some of the places and names of these characters are not new to you. You've heard them before, but before, but a few are obscure enough that you may not know them very well, or at least not in terms of how they fit into this story. <clears throat> Some of those places and names are Rome, Colossae, Philemon, Onesimus, Epaphras, Tychicus, Paul, Archippus, Appia, and Timothy. As the story progresses, you'll see how each of these places and people were used by God for a very, very specific purpose. This is a very short book, but a very big story. Oh, and there's one other character. Uh, that's you. I'll let God describe and identify you. First of all, the cities. Rome, Colossae, and Ephesus. Rome was big and powerful, and the Roman Empire ruled the world, at least till about 400 A.D., and here at Christmas time, we're familiar with names like Caesar Augustus and then later Nero. At the time of Paul and Philemon, Rome's population was about 7 million, with the entire empire at about 25 million. And that's one of the places that God sent Paul. Romans 1 8, Paul writes, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Because your faith is being reported all over the world. Then in verse 11, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Obviously, about a year later, he did indeed go there. But this time it was for legal matters to appear before Nero. Uh, the Caesar at that time. And there's Ephesus. As we all know, Ephesus was a key city in terms of expansion of Christianity. You hear it in just about every sermon, some reference to the Ephesians. The Apostle Paul found this church on his second missionary journey and then returned during his third missionary journey and stayed there three years. You'll recall names like Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla. They're also strong teachers there. During Paul's time, according to Acts 19, he spent a time at a lecture hall at the house of Tyrannus for two years. It seems that one of the students there, Epaphras, came from Colossae, was saved, and later returned home to evangelize several towns in that area, including Colossae, Laodicea, and Areopolis. And there was Colossae. Most importantly, this was the hometown of Philemon, to whom Paul wrote this letter. It was located in southwest Phrygia in Asia, which was about 90 miles straight east of Ephesus. Like its neighboring town, Laodicea, it was famous for its fine wool, particularly when they dyed it purple through use of a local flower. <coughs> Excuse me. The church there was probably started during Paul's third missionary journey even though he never personally visited this city. Colossae was destroyed about 60 AD, but it was rebuilt, uh, totally independent of Rome. Now about some of the actors in this story. First, the Apostle Paul. He's obviously the most well-known, and several of us who have been teaching in adult Sunday school have obviously spent considerable time on the man God used to write most of the New Testament. So I won't elaborate much on him, except of his involvement with many who were associated with him in those three missionary journeys. This is particularly true with his familiarity with Philemon. 
in the church at Colossae. And then, of course, his two imprisonments in Rome, which eventually ended in his death. He was born a few years after Jesus was, approximately 4 AD. He was saved on the Damascus Road about 34 AD, then spent about 14 years in the wilderness being taught by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 13, we find him and he and Barnabas starting their first missionary journeys in 46 to 48 AD, and then their second missionary journey with Silas in 50 to 52 AD, and his third followed in 53 to 57 AD. And finally, his journey to Rome in 59 AD. He was released from his first prison and imprisonment in Rome after two years, which occurred about 62 AD. And then according to Eusebius, he was martyred about 67 AD, which was about three years after Nero's persecution of the Christians broke out. Here's the setting, including the characters in this story. As mentioned, the Church of Colossae was probably started by Epaphras. We, we read in Colossians 1, 6, the gospel has come to you all over the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as, as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. As I shared a few weeks ago in the study of the churches of Galatia, uh, the Judaizers were bent on infiltrating any person or organization that believed in Jesus. The pressure was so severe that Epaphras, their pastor, made the long 1,200-mile trip to Rome to meet with Paul to get counsel on how to deal with that. It seems that Epaphras actually stayed in Rome as a fellow servant with Paul. Typical of that time, the church was meeting in house churches, and one of the prominent members there was Philemon. Already in verse 1, we find Paul addressing his letter to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Abvia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church that meets in your home. As we heard from Pastor J.D. and earlier in Luke, uh, Mary and Bethany, uh, so too, Philemon welcomed the church to meet in their home, which probably indicated a certain size and probably a certain amount of wealth in order that he could have a home of that size. His home was probably well known as a free holiday inn to any of the believers traveling through that area. It's likely that he also was saved through the ministry of Paul while he was in Ephesus. In verse 19, Paul even reminds him of his salvation when he says, not to mention that you owe me your very self. After Epaphras left to meet Paul in Rome, it seems that Archippus was entrusted to the pastoral responsibilities in the church in Colossae. In verse 2, Paul refers to Archippus, where it is assumed that Aphia was a wife of Philemon, and Archippus was Philemon's son. The next character in this story is Onesimus, who happens to be a slave of Philemon, seemingly the central figure. To the casual reader, the book of Philemon may come across as an attempt of Christians to deal with the social history, issue of slavery. That's not the focus of this book. True, Onesimus, a slave, may be the who of the story, but the real purpose of Paul's writing this letter is going to come out a little later. However, the subject of slavery for both Philemon and us still needs to be dealt with, both socially and more specifically, spiritually. So let's deal with it briefly as part of this story. In first century AD, the Roman emperor, slavery was looked at differently than American Civil War slavery. In the Greco-Roman world, slaves have been given many types of freedom, such as marrying, worshiping, and making money. Some were teachers, architects, doctors, or whatever they set out to become vocationally, even though they were not considered as persons under the law. The Roman Senate in 20 AD granted slaves accused of crimes the right to a trial. 
as we discussed in our study of Galatians, where Paul was demonstrating the purpose of the law, he used the pedagogue as an example. The pedagogue or tutor was frequently well, a well-educated slave who taught, disciplined, and protected the child until he became old enough to be considered an adult by his father. Race was not an issue. It was possible for slaves to gain freedom through what is called manumission. That is the voluntary act of a slave owner to set him free, even though it was sanctioned by the law. In U.S. history, freedom also occurred, but that was either through emancipation or abolition, both of which were acts of government. In addition, there were fewer personal rights for the slave, including owning property. Early on, most states considered slaves as chattel property. It was true that in both Paul's time and colonial America, not all slaves were treated poorly, but it was equally true that all slaves were owned by someone else. And that was consistent throughout all periods of slavery. And being owned certainly had its implications, how they lived. Murray, Murray Harris, in his book, Slaves of Christ, states that at the heart of slavery, ancient or modern, are the ideas of total dependence, the forfeiture of autonomy, and the sense of belonging totally to another. As we started out today, uh, once upon a time, here's what we find. Specifically in the church of Colossae, Philemon, a somewhat well-to-do homeowner, attended church and was known in the community as an upstanding citizen and a kindly man, at minimum, and a dear friend and fellow worker to Paul. As was somewhat customary at that time, he owned a slave named Onesimus. He may have owned more, but Scripture doesn't state that. Apparently, Onesimus had done something wrong to his master, perhaps stealing from him, and then he ran away. Paul alludes to this in verse 11. Formerly, he, he was useless to you. Ironically, his name means profitable. In spite of the fact that Rome was a long and difficult 1,200 miles away, it was large and would provide a better hiding place for Onesimus. So he headed to Rome, away from the slave catchers who would either sell him or return him to his master, Philemon. Certainly the stolen money helped pay for the trip. But he had miscalculated one small item. God knows all and sees all, even when you're trying to run and hide. With all the luck in the world, or could have been providence, Onesimus runs into Paul, or one of his co-workers in Rome, who brings him to Paul. As a result of his unplanned contact with Paul, he was led to Christ. Guess what happens to this useless person? He begins to live up to the meaning of his name, and became very helpful to Paul during his house arrest in Rome. Their relationship grew to the point where Paul later said in verse 10, I appeal to you for my son Anesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. That statement comes from someone who knew the word chains. He even refers to himself in many of his letters as a bondservant. As is true of any really good story, there has to be a problem. And certainly this scene will meet the requirements. Here in Rome, we have this godly evangelist who was or will be used to write much of the New Testament. And he's sitting in prison, at least on house arrest. He needs encouragement, and who knows what other items he may need to continue his ministry, <clears throat> perhaps food or writing tablets, or like he wrote to Timothy in chapter 4. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. And there's this other new Christian, Onesimus, a runaway slave who's really grown fond of Paul and helpful to him. And they're both enjoying it. But he's got slave catchers on the lookout for him. He's apparently repented of his sin, of theft, and running away from his rightful owner, Philemon, and he became saved, but he's 1,200 miles away. 
and actually liking his new ministry and his friendship with Paul. Then way over in another part of the world is another godly man who is very helpful in the church at Colossae. Philemon also could use some help. But he's living with a little bit less cash and one slave short. As you and I sit here this morning, it seems safer not to have to deal with that exact issue that those three did 2,000 years ago. But is it really? Any of you have a job? Any of you here the CEO? Or maybe the low man on the totem pole? Or a man, or a woman, or young, or old? Maybe we're not quite as exempt as we'd like to pretend. Before we get into the specifics of how to deal with this difficult situation, let's look at what the New Testament says about some of this. In Titus chapter 2, Paul is writing to, uh, to Titus regarding what to teach a variety of groups in the church in Crete. He specifically mentions older men, older women, younger women, younger men. And then in verse 9, he says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them. Not to talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. At this point, he doesn't even mention the master's role or refer to the possible reason for pleasing the master. It was plain and simple. So that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive attractive. Then in Paul's first letter to Timothy, he's again giving instructions for leaders, specifically how to help with widows and for elders and for slaves. He states in chapter 6, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Again, not for the benefit of the master, but so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. As we look at Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and specifically his admonition for unity, we find him addressing wives, then husbands, then children, and then fathers. And in chapter 6, he says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, <clears throat> whether he's slave or free. Again, the listed motive has nothing to do with the benefit of the slave or the master but in doing the will of God from your heart. In this case, Paul also addresses the masters, not just the slaves. In verse 9, he says, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no favoritism. Then in his letter to the church at Colossae, Paul is again giving instructions for how Christians should act, particularly within the Christian households. This happens to be not only the church that both Philemon and Onesimus attended, but they even lived in the same household. In chapter 3, he says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eyes on you with the wind their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Picking up on a little, uh, he says the same thing quite frequently. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. Because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Here we find Paul again addressing both the slave and the master. But it is in every case, the reason does not re reflect the potential benefit to either the slave or the master because it's the Lord Christ you're serving. Nowhere in Scripture do we find the institution of human slavery is directly prohibited. 
but certainly it's full of principles about the humane treatment of God's created beings. Simple kindness as a starter is not too far removed from the heart of God, nor should it be for his children. But now it's time for Paul to roll up his sleeves and deal with life at its fullest. He's sitting in Rome on house arrest and yet enjoying time with his newfound friend, Anisimus, who has just repented of his theft and running away and become saved. Undoubtedly, he was grateful to Paul, and therefore life as Paul's fellow worker had to be new, exciting, and rewarding. So from an outward point of view, things were looking up in Rome. Except for Paul's innards, he knew the law. He knew legalism. He knew prison. He knew slavery. But he also knew forgiveness and Jesus intimately. Therefore, on the basis of what he knew, the scenario just did not sit well. It simply was not right. Much had to take place to correct faulty relationships. One of his dear friends, Philemon, had illegally lost a slave. And Paul was probably the only one who knew where and how and why. Anisimus had repented and been forgiven of his sins, but he did not have restoration with his former owner. Paul had taught the truth about relationships many times and places, and he couldn't avoid acting on what he knew the godly thing to do. So he began by writing a letter, not only to his friend Philemon, but also to his friend's wife and his son, by now the acting pastor, as well as to the whole church in Colossae. And he also understood that those personal letters were read to all the other churches in the area. In Colossians 4.10, Paul says, After this letter has been read to you, see that, to it that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. His personal letter to Philemon began with his thanking God and how he had been praying for Philemon to be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. That's not the setting for him to just write and say, how are you? I am fine. And not even mention anything about Anisimus. That's not how godly men relate and certainly not how to deal with <clears throat> tough issues. After Paul shared his gratitude for Philemon's brotherhood, he lays the cards on the table. Paul knew that he needed to notify Philemon that he was sending the runaway slave Onesimus back, even though he was saved in a personal joy. Paul said it as the late Adrian Rogers used to say, I'm going to give it to you big, tall, and straight. He said, number one, repentance number two, restoration, number three, return, and four, reconciliation. They were all absolutely necessary. But how do you say that to two dear friends, each on different ends of the situation in a way that they both understood and they both might cooperate in? Paul was aware of his own calling to apostleship and how difficult it, different it was from the other apostles. He was also aware that much of the Christian world also knew the difference. That's why he so often felt that he had to defend his apostleship, which certainly had to be painful in light of his extreme tender heart. Instead, in this case, he wanted to make a special request to Philemon that he would take Anisimus back as a slave. Not as a slave, but as a brother. Actually, this was not a special request. It was simply God's way of doing things. And Paul knew it. Therefore, and although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. <clears throat> Paul even slips in what may be construed as a sympathy appeal when he refers to as being an old man and also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul's relational style of evangelism in terms of truthfulness, but also in terms of tenderness and affection, comes out loud and clear. 
In verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. This is referring to his relationship to a new birth in Christ by calling Onesimus my son. It's not foreign to Paul. He does the same thing in his first epistle to Timothy. When he, in verse 2, he begins, To Timothy, my true son in the faith. I can only imagine heaven when we see a long line of obviously saved people approaching Paul as sons in the faith. But not just Paul. Just a reminder, isn't that your and my invite, indeed command, to find those kind of relationships? Simply the Great Commission and operation in our own lives. Paul's tenderness toward Philemon was not simply a negotiation style that he learned in the psychological marketing class under Gamaliel. Philemon also was a spiritual fruit of Paul's life. His plea included in reminding Philemon of the good old days shortly after that he had been saved by Paul during his time of teaching at the lecture halls of Tyrannus and Ephesus. In verse 12, Paul says, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in change for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you will do will be spontaneous and not forced. And in verse 16, he's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me as a partner, welcome him as you would me. That sounds a lot like something Jesus said. Seek ye first, and then. Even though it was crucial for the sake of justice that Philemon get his rightfully owned slave back, as a slave, it was even more important that he gains a brother. And it really could all happen in the same package deal. Based on Philemon's reading Paul's letter up to this point, it would seem not only a possible option, but even a workable one. However, there was still possibly the nagging thought of the lost money and the lost time that Onesimus had taken. Philemon obviously had needed someone to do what Onesimus was doing at the time he ran away. He more than likely needed to be replaced. Paul had already thought of that, which is why he wrote in verse 18, if he's done anything wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hands. I'll pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Note the sincerity and intensity that Paul demonstrates. First of all, he points out that he has written this with his own hands. This is not simply a routine dictated letter typed by some secretary and then dropped in the mailbox. Paul had personally handwritten this, and he felt every word of it. Secondly, he reminds Philemon, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Without God using Paul and Philemon's life back in Ephesus, Philemon would just be an unsaved citizen of Colossae. Onesimus owned owed Philemon a physical and a temporal debt, which Paul offered to pay. Philemon owed Paul a spiritual and eternal debt, which one could never be repaid. There was never a more perfect demonstration of what Christ did for Philemon and all of us. But Paul's concern was not just for Philemon. His heart was also about seeing to that Onesimus was returned because he had more steps to his spiritual growth that needed to occur. Onesimus had confessed his running away and his theft. He was repentant and he saved. So, so, so what's the problem? He had not been restored to his rightful owner, Philemon. Philemon. 
Paul knew that that was necessary for Onesimus if he was to fully understand the complete cycle of forgiveness. Paul states in verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So in reality, how did this actually all happen? Paul just books him a red-eye flight from Rome to Colossae International, and it's all taken care of. Actually, Paul not only knew Jesus and Scripture and godly principles of how to cure for longtime sinners and recent converts, but he also had a head and a heart that understood sin and prisons and slave catchers. 1,200 miles from Rome to Colossae was a long and rugged trip, and he knew that the closer he got to Colossae, the more dangerous it would be for Onesimus. Slave catching was a lucrative and active vocation at that time and could have possibly put an end to the godly endeavor. And it just so happened, at least that's how most stories go, but we also know that this is not just another story. And the correct word for it just so happened is providence. How blessed we are to be totally aware and actually live our lives in the knowledge that God, our supreme being, sits on the throne and controls every move. So too, that was true in Paul's day. <clears throat> While he was on house arrest in the Roman jail, Paul wrote that we know as the prison letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, all about 60 to 61 AD. And their mail route was not very similar to ours, but more so like the Pony Express. It just so happened that all four letters needed to go to churches in Asia Minor in somewhat close proximity to each other. Specifically, one of them was going to the church at Colossae, where it's Philemon attended, and so did Onesimus previously. And it just so happened that Tychicus was going that way. In verse 7, we read, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to your to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. Within the church, the body of Christ, it's very helpful and comforting to have confidence that there is in there is unity. Paul writes in verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Even more than I ask. Assurance from 1,200 miles does one's heart good. And then he continues in verse 22. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to restore to you in answer to your prayers. As Paul closes his letter to Philemon, it's interesting who he lists as others sending their greetings. Certainly Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. He had been the hometown boy and well-loved who had originally started the church in Colossae and was now ministering in change with Paul in Rome. In light of the topic of this letter, namely forgiveness, it's significant that Mark sends his greetings. You remember that at the beginning of Paul and Silas' second missionary journey, Mark had suddenly quit, and he left for Cyprus, causing a huge rift in relationship. But later in, in 2 Timothy 4, we read, Get Mark and bring him with you, because he's helpful in my ministry. God had indeed provided forgiveness and reconciliation. Then there's Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica who, Thessalonica, who traveled with Paul to Rome, whom Paul calls a fellow worker. And then there was Demas, who at one time was a faithful worker with Paul, but in 2 Timothy 4, 9, we read, And Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone on to Thessalonica. And then the faithful Dr. Luke, the beloved physician, and it wasn't just for Paul's annual physical. Life for both Paul and us involved a variety of personalities, all with the goal of love and unity. 
as we started today's lesson, I said that to the casual reader, the book of Philemon deals with the issue of slavery. But that's not the focus of this book. The real issue is forgiveness, an option with consequences. Anisimus stole and ran away. One of his options was to confess, repent, and ask first God, then Paul, then Philemon for forgiveness. Philemon was asked first of all by Paul, and then eventually by Onesimus for forgiveness. Sin is sin and has temporal and eternal consequences. That's true for Onesimus, and it's true for us. Paul asked Philemon in verse 17, So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done anything wrong to you or owes you anything, charge it to me. That's imputation. The attributing to someone else what I am incapable of providing. That's God's rule. As we find in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God imputed our sin to Christ who knew no sin, and God imputed his righteousness to us who had no righteousness. Paul was able to ask a real favor of Philemon simply based on God's imputation, and so can we. Because of his total confidence in who God was, Paul was able to face two men, Onesimus and Philemon, with a real life crisis situation. And he was not ashamed or afraid to ask what he knew was possible. In verse 20, Paul writes, I do wish, brother, that I might have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. The last weekend of June 2020, Connie and I had been struggling with some personal and spiritual issues. We went to Tulsa to visit our youngest daughter and her husband, with whom we have a very close and spiritual relationship. That weekend, we poured out our hearts to them, and they listened very intently. After they weighed our hurt and our struggle, they looked at us and said, Mom, Dad, you're just looking for something more. Sunday, July 12, we found ourselves in a worship service in a large room at the Doubletree Motel. And God, again, has provided something more. Fellow believers, we also were at one time slaves in need of imputation and forgiveness. But God, let's encourage each other to continue to do something more. And then we'll be able to live happily ever after. Do I dismiss?